And the reason why you do this, actually, is um, the, uh, each time it's got a significance. But when we read in Exodus 12, in Exodus 12, verses 12 and 13, there's four times that God says, I will. I will do this, and I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. And those four I will statements are how the rabbis came up with that there would be four cups. The first cup is called the Kiddush cup, or the cup of sanctification. And uh, this is, uh, we say we drink this cup as we start out the meal. The second is called the cup of plagues. The third is called the cup of redemption. This is the focal point of really the whole uh, um, service. And then the fourth is called the cup of praise, or the cup of hello. But it's with this first cup that the host holds aloft and offers a blessing for all the service to follow. Holding this Kiddush cup, he offers praise and thanks to God Almighty, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And in Hebrew, the blessings are very often chanted, and the blessing of this cup goes like this. Baruch Atanai Eloheinu Elohim Borei Pri Amen. Now with the blessing of the cup and the candles lit, now the service or the Seder has officially begun. And what happens now is that the youngest child present comes forward to ask the meaning of Passover. And it really could be argued that the Passover is for the children as a way of imparting to the next generation the stories of God's faithfulness in the past. And the way in which this is done is through the, uh, the reading and the chanting of the traditional uh, four questions. There are four of them. And uh, usually it's the youngest child present that, that says this. And uh, it's it's how we then structure the rest of the, the evening. Now, I want to say something about this, because uh, when I was a child, uh, when I was probably about six, I asked the four questions in my family Seder uh, in Hebrew. When my children were about maybe six or seven, they asked the four questions. I don't know if you realize this or not, but you live in a unique world in terms of the Jewish community. In the United States, there are 5 million Jewish people. 2 million live in the New York metropolitan area. 1 million live in the 5 boroughs. And not that many in Staten Island. So what it means is, 1 out of every 8 or 9 people in New York City is Jewish. The religious, the orthodox community, you know, black folks, black hat, curls, the whole deal. There are probably more religious ultra-Orthodox Jews in New York City and the New York area than in Jerusalem. You have the opportunity to interact with people in a way that most, most people around the world don't. Now, what's important to the Jewish community? Tradition. And not just because Tevia on Fiddler on the Roof sang it. But that my child and their child and their child will do this. Because my father and his father and his father and his father, going all the way back to Moses, did this. The biggest challenge for Jewish people, considering Jesus as the Messiah, is that my father didn't believe it. And his father didn't believe it. And his father didn't believe it. And his father didn't. And I don't want my child to believe it, and their child, and their child. In a sense, it's that breaking of that tradition. But what we know is, we know is, that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. I celebrated Passover every year growing up. I continue to, today, as a believer. Why? Because it's part of who I am, and it tells the story of redemption. And again, I hope that you see that Passover is a connection to that story that goes all the way back from Moses to David to Jesus and continues on. So, back to the four questions. The four questions. Uh, the first one, uh, and they're here in the God, the first one goes like this. 
How is this night different than all the other nights? Great question. Very different night, all kinds of strange things that we eat. And we answer the child by telling them a story. And we say that we were once slaves in Egypt. And we cried out to God, and God heard our cry, and we sent Moses, and plagues, and God of Egypt, and it was great. We read many of the early chapters of, of Exodus, but at the end of that, we say to the child that ultimately, this night is different, not just because our, because our ancestors came out of Egypt, but this night is different when we celebrate Passover, because tonight, we're in Egypt. Tonight, we're the ones who are slaves. We're the ones that cry out to God. God hears our cry, and we are redeemed. You see, Passover doesn't just tell the story of redemption. Passover tells us how redemption happens. In the same way 4,000 years ago as today, Passover happens through the sacrifice of a spotless, innocent lamb. In Egypt, you remember the story, the 10th plague, our ancestors would take a spotless lamb. Why a lamb? Somebody asked me this the other day. Why not a, why not a goose? <laughs> why not a camel? I have a 12-year-old daughter, and maybe, maybe, if I ask that 12 year my daughter, who, who, what do you think of as the most innocent animal that you can imagine? She'd probably say a lamb. Certainly not a goose or a duck. Uh, she would probably say a lamb. And you take an innocent lamb, and that lamb is killed. And its blood is painted on the doors of your house. And whoever is in that house, is spared the penalty of the tenth plague. If you're in the home and you have blood on your door, right? You're okay. If you don't, the firstborn of your family will die. Now, it didn't matter if you were Jewish. Gotta see this. In Egypt, if you were Jewish, were you God's chosen? Sure. Descendant of Abraham. Absolutely. Child, were there promises made to you? Without a doubt. But if you didn't put blood on your doors, your firstborn would die. Similarly, if you were not Jewish, and you were in a home, or you put blood on your door, your firstborn would be spared. It's a picture that salvation is not about ethnicity. It's not about who we're born as. But it is that we apply the blood to the doorposts of our home in the person of the Messiah, Jesus. We apply the blood to the doorposts of our own hearts. We've said, being born in a bakery doesn't make you a bagel. <laughs> Any more than being born in a church makes you a Christian. We all have to take that step and apply the blood to our own hearts. Okay, now the child asks question number two. Why, why do we eat the matzah, the unleavened bread? And we explain that when our ancestors left Egypt, they had to leave very, very, very quickly. And there was not enough time for the bread to rise. And so we eat the matzah as a way of remembering and identifying with that experience. Now, one of the interesting items here on the table is this one. This is called a, a matzah tosh. That just means matzah bag. Inside are three layers of matzah, each one separated from the others by a bit of cloth. And what happens now is the head of the house reaches in, takes out the middle one. A blessing is said and it's broken. One half is just set aside, the other half is given a very special name. It's called the afi komen. The afi komen. Why don't you say that with me? Very good. Avikomen is not a Hebrew word, it's a Greek word. And it means that which comes later, or dessert. And uh, so what, it's not eaten, but instead it's put in this, um, in this special bag, and it's part of a game that we play with the children. And all the kids would close their eyes, and the adults go somewhere in the house. The Avikomen is hidden. Later, it has to be found, or the service can't go on. But for now, the child asks uh, the remaining questions. Why in this time do we eat bitter herbs? And why do we uh, recline when we eat? Well, we've already answered the question about 
reclining as it speaks of our redemption, let me explain the question about bitter herbs by showing you this. Now this is called a Seder plate. A Seder plate. And uh, the way it works is that each one of these small uh, containers here, areas, they have a bit of food. And you eat some of this different food, and there's one plate for the whole table, and we eat these different items, and as we eat them, it helps us relive and read and understand the story of redemption. Now, the first item on the Seder uh, plate is this one, and it's called uh, carpus or greens. We have parsley, and really it could be anything with a very deep green color, and a green symbolizes life, especially if you're living in the desert. Okay? So um, we eat this, but before we do, we dip the greens in salt water, very salty water. The salt water represents tears. So by dipping, we're reminded that a life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. And in our family, what we do is we dip it in, and we hold it up, and we watch it drip. And we're reminded of the tears that we shed when we were in Egypt. And then each person would go ahead and, and eat. Which I'm not going to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> the next item on the Seder plate is this one. It's called the Hazarek. It's the root of the bitter herb. It's an onion, sometimes a horseradish root. We don't eat it. We just look at it. Nice? Okay. This reminds us that the root of life is bitter for anybody in slavery, whether it was 4,000 years ago or today. And uh, this is a visual reminder. The next item, however, is called the maru, or the bitter herb itself. This is freshly ground horseradish. And each adult at the table is supposed to eat about a tablespoon full of the horseradish. It's about a tablespoon more. Uh, any volunteers? <laughs> We're on tape, so. No? Do you know what happens when you eat a tablespoon of horseradish? You cry. That's right. Yeah. There's really no choice in the matter, okay? Uh, uh, and if, for some strange reason, that you eat a tablespoon and you don't cry, you have to keep eating more until you do. <laughs> Passover, remember, this is like a multimedia experience. Not only do we hear the story, but we taste the story, we feel the story, and you're supposed to eat enough horseradish so that tears come running down your cheeks. Remember, we're remembering what it was like to be a slave. Now, the next item is a contrast. This is called the karosik, and this is made of chopped apples, honey, raisins, nuts, very sweet, very delicious. This is symbolic of the mortar that Pharaoh required the Jewish people to use to make bricks for all of the building projects. And uh, we, we eat it, and as we remember that, um, we also remember that the, there was bitterness in uh, the, uh, the experience of all of this building. And so when we eat this uh, apple mixture, we mix in a little bit more horseradish just to remind us that there was bitterness in our toil and in our labor. Okay? It's kind of, yeah, it's the way it goes. So. Now, what we've done so far, candles, first cup. Three matzahs, the hidden matzah, the greens, the bitter herbs, the sweet mixture were all there during Jesus' day. He would have done everything so far. The last two items on the plate today were added a little bit after his death. An egg, a brown egg, a roasted egg, to remind us of the temple sacrifice that was roasted on the altar. And a bone, a lamb-shanked bone, the leg bone of a lamb. Now on Passover, lamb is not eaten as the meal. Uh, because today there's no sacrifice. There's no temple, there's no altar, there's no lamb. And so today in many Jewish homes, lamb's not served. But what we do have is we have a bone that sits on the table that reminds us that sacrifices no longer exist. Now, it's an interesting question. For those of you that, that know the Bible, you, you would ask, well, how is it that you have forgiveness of your sins? The Bible, the Torah, talks about 
that uh, there is a sacrifice on the altar, and, and it says, by the, by the blood we are saved. 